Thank you for being here, and, and uh, thank you, Dr. Bronner, for uh, inviting me to be here and wanting me to be part of this, this program. I think that what Congressman, the Congressman and, and uh, Artemisia Stanberry have done is kind of lift a veil uh, off an amazing transformation that took place in my adopted home state in the 70s, the 80s, and 90s. It was a transformation that caused the region to lurch from Bill Bolkhoner's dogs to Richard Arrington's election and beyond. But they maintained persuasively that it was the marchers and the willing jail inmates and the movement leaders that were only a part of that transformation. And that was necessary for it to be completed was the stealth reconstruction that they discuss in the book. Let's listen to this quote as an example. My own political participation was grounded in stealth politics as much as in the movement. I can think of numerous important people, white and black, working together who quietly laid foundations for my career and changes in our area. That was Richard Arrington, the longtime mayor of the city of Birmingham. And I think what Richard Arrington has done is moved the thesis of, of uh, stealth reconstruction into the, into the realm of reality. It no longer is a thesis, but it is true historical fact. We have an excellent panel of, of folks to talk about the thesis or the historical fact, as I'll call it, today. And of course, on my immediate left is Congressman Browder himself, who was, of course, the uh, elected to the Alabama House of Representatives in 82, to the Secretary of State's office in 86, then to the U.S. House in 89 until 1996. On his left is co-author and former congressional aide to the congressman, a now a professor of political science at North Carolina Central University, and also a native of Mobile, and that is uh, Armitage Stanberry. Thank you for being with us. Sharon Heron is the past president of the Alabama Political Science Association and a, and a professor of, stu of political science at ASU here in Montgomery. Bill Stewart, the retired chair, but not tired at all, of the, uni uh, the, the political science department at the University of Alabama. He's also a professor emeritus of political science at the university. And Markeisha Ricks, I think I skipped, I skipped you two, I'm sorry. I don't think anyone made a mistake between who's who there. Uh, Markeisha Ricks, former Aniston Star and Tuscaloosa News reporter. She now reports on politics and state government uh, for the Montgomery Advertiser, and I certainly look forward to reading her material each and every day. So I, we're going to start with uh, the congressman and move down the line, and each of you have, uh, have planned, uh, planned comments. And we'll get to a question and answer period, which many times is perhaps the liveliest part of these things. Well, let's start with the congressman. Thank you, Tim, and it's very nice to be back here. Uh, I have five minutes. I think we, what we want to hear is discussion of the book by the uh, uh, other panelists and uh, hopefully some discussion with the audience. But in, the, in my five minutes, what I would like to, to do is to tell you where the book came from. As I reached the end of my political career, I started thinking about some of the changes that, that I had observed. And it occurred to me that there were some changes in the South that had never been written about. As a political scientist, I had studied Southern politics uh, for 10 years before I went into politics. But when I came down here to Montgomery and served in the Alabama legislature, I saw something very strange, something that we had never never studied, something we had never thought, thought about. And I tried to, uh, to, try to try to understand that. What we're here to tell you about today is an untold story about Southern politics, particularly Alabama politics, it's untold for, for some good reasons. Back in those days, those of us who were politicians could not tell the story of biracial, quiet, practical biracial uh, politics because it would have destroyed our careers. Black leaders who were working with us could not tell about it because it would have destroyed their careers with their constituents. So the untold story is a story of progress, not as much progress to satisfy, to satisfy everybody, but, um, but a progress. It's untold because politicians couldn't talk about it, because academics couldn't get into the hearts and minds and back rooms of politicians, and frankly because uh, journalists not only couldn't get the story, but, you know, journalism is uh, generally about writing about conflict rather than cooperation. So the story was not told then, and for those very same reasons, it's hard to tell it now. And I must tell you that it's pretty uncomfortable telling this story 
in getting people to talk about it. That's why the people who are quoted in here, some, and I think some of your names will amaze you, uh, I think they, they need to be congratulated for their candor because we who, are, who, who tell this story are dying out, and this story uh, needs to be told. So I called on my uh, colleague, Artemisia Stanberry, who was teaching me that time at Prayer Review uh, in Texas, and told her that I thought we had a story that needed to be told, and I thought that it needed to be told by one black author and one white author, because too often we find stories written about Southern politics, racial politics, by white political scientists or white authors, or by black authors. So uh, I asked her, do you want to try a partnership on this? It worked out very well. We get along well, we're good friends. Uh, I'm an older, white, male, relatively conservative uh, guy. She's a younger, black, female, relatively liberal uh, gal, and we've worked very well together. Of course, quite often that involves jerking a knot in each other's tails, which we, we, which we do uh, very, uh, very regularly, but it has worked out well. That's where the uh, book came from. We, we approached it from three angles. One, my, my history, my career. Two, we did a survey of Southern politicians, uh, former members of Congress in other Southern states. And three, we assembled a group of people, Paul Herbert, Joe Reed, Jerome Gray, uh, George Wallace Jr., uh, a, a lot of people who had participated in, in quiet, practical biracial politics at that time, and we, we built a virtual round table, a discussion. They never sat around one table, but we built a virtual round table because they had the discussion. They then could come back and add to the discussion or argue or disagree. Uh, and those are the three ways that we approach telling the story. I'll stop there and turn it over to Artemisia to give you something about the conclusions and, and her response. Okay, good afternoon. I uh, hope everyone's doing well, and uh, thank you again for inviting me to the archives. I, I, I grew up in Alabama. I'm actually, I can say this because I'm in Alabama, but I'm from Chantula, Alabama, which is, uh, uh, you guys may know uh, North, North Mobile County, but the only time I'm able to say Chantula, Alabama is when I'm in Alabama. Everybody else, I have to say Mobile, and they say Mobile? No, <laughs> Mobile. Um, so, um, well, I, I'm going to keep my remarks brief as well because it's always an opportunity to get other people's perspectives on our uh, on our book. Um, but as, as Glenn said, you know, the book is about quiet biracial uh, politics in the post civil rights era. And you know, just as there are people who have questions um, about this, this DC, even those who engage in quiet racial uh, in um, quiet biracial politics don't like to use the term stealth because of a tenacious type of nature they assess to it. Um, they, they do recognize or they do ad admit that they did involve in this type in this type of behavior, and you know the email. If if we want, we joked before that the emails and the conversations the first two years when we were coming with the title and and, and these these concepts that can be a book in and of itself, <laughs> you know. But because I am progressive and and he is moderate too. By the way, if I can interrupt. I don't know of any other book about Southern politics that has biracial authorship. Are you aware of any other? Not off the top of my head. Um, so just quickly with, with some, some of the uh, um, con conclusions. We interviewed several, several people, and um, you know, people did recognize that in the post-civil rights era, when it was still, even in our state, our great state of Alabama, it was, it was still um, taboo to, for blacks and whites to meet, to, to meet together, right? Let them alone come together and talk about policy. Let alone come together and talk about electing another, Af uh, appointing an African American judge. Let alone come together to talk about funds for Alabama, Alabama State. So you had, after the post civil rights movement, you had to have the implementation phase. You have the Voting Rights Act, you have the Civil Rights Act. What, and the marking is, 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 is markings are ending have several assassinations that occurred. And so you needed people to come together to say, okay, we gotta move the South forward, one way or the other. And so these individuals um, worked together quietly and some progress, uh, some progress was, was, was made. I mean, I mentioned the judges, we mentioned the, um, um, the, 
the, the, the, on the video, which I think is a great video, the poll wa um, watchers and the significance of that. And so, um, so in overall, you know, whether it's in Alabama, people interviewed in, in North Carolina, not so much the people we interviewed in Texas, um, um, they wouldn't necessarily agree with that. They, they would come to the conclusion that that progress was made. So if we look, if we're looking at this from the 21st century, I heard someone out there earlier mention the um, Ron Sparks, Arthur Davis race. When we reflect on that, um, when the new, when Alabama Democratic Conference, the New South Coalition, and others were thinking about who they're going to endorse, they'll say we endorse you, but we'll keep it quiet so that you can keep your seat, right? But in return for your endorsement, we want X, Y, and Z. And you know, in many ways, that's how Alabama got 25% of the state legislature that's African American. So you have these sustainable groups. So you look, you fast forward to 21st century, and you have for the first time an African American with a significant chance of um, of um, being elected to governor. Our our ex-resident now, <laughs> Arthur Davis, uh, who's uh, a little bitter right now, but uh, <laughs> and and then and then you have Ron Sparks. So this is what happened. Alabama Democratic Coalition and others. Back at that time, they said, we will endorse you, but you have to come before us. We will endorse you, we'll keep it quiet, but you have to come before us. And now you have a, um, a white politician like, yes, I'll come before you, and I want you to tell people that I'm endorsing you, which is a 180 degree turn from self. And you have the African American candidate that says, well, <laughs> I, want, I, don't, I, I sort of want your endorsement, but I don't want to come before you because it may not work in, a, in, a general, in, in the general election. And so the thing is, and, and just in conclusion, this, 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 is, this is a 180 degree turn, but it just tells you it was necessary at that time for the Heflins, et cetera, to come before the ADC and black groups to say, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm on your side. I want to do this. But if you go out there yelling that, you know, I'm getting this, this, what is, um, what we call, this, um, this award, this um, courage, profiles and courage award, I may not be able to help you the next time because I may not be uh, be elected, and that and that's the context. It was a, it was a, um, a strategy and a method used for that time, and it's not to discount the 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 legislation, um, the the move, the marches, the important people. We're just saying that there's another aspect of this that historians and political scientists do not write about, and there are a lot of unsung heroes. And there are a lot of legitimate policies that were put into place as a result of that. And we actually get into um, several of those in, um, in, in the book. So I will, I actually didn't time myself, but I will keep it uh, at my remarks at, um, at that place that I left out. And that last quote I had up there is also uh, some significant, and I'll turn it over to and, the chair. And I'm going to interrupt for another crass commercial announcement. <laughs> this is the book Artemisia is, and I've been talking about. Stealth Reconstructing, which is available for sale out here. But if you want the story of the 180 degree turn that she's talking about at the present time, that is this book, The South's New Racial Politics, Inside the Race Game of Southern History, which is also one of my books. It's available out there. So if you want to know about the, the past few decades, this one. If you want to know about today, this is the one for you. That's our commercial for today. Make, make sure that works because we will use it. Or if not, we can use someone else. I think that's one of the wild ones. Technician? Okay.
race and politics in the Montgomery area. Um, and I think more discussions like this need to occur uh, because my comments today probably incorporate some things from the first book and the second book and give us things to think about for the future. I'm a native Montgomeryan, by the way. I've lived uh, several other places, but uh, my roots are here. And so a couple of the things I may mention stem from having uh, grown up uh, in Montgomery, but also having had experiences in other places. One of the things uh, that we think about uh, when we think about stealth um, is the quiet, secret nature of actions that can be taken without anyone knowing. But I would venture to say that when I think of politics, uh, quiet does not exist. Uh, for the silence is very loud when things do not occur in the manner in which everyone assumes they should. And uh, this is sort of the futuristic part of this. Uh, since the election of President Barack Obama, uh, the discussions about race and politics have become in vogue uh, once again. And I'll briefly reference the infamous uh, Beer Summit, uh, if you all are familiar with that. But if you think about it, uh, initially pundits were saying there was no need to ever discuss race and politics um, combined again since we had achieved the ultimate goal of electing someone uh, who was a minority to the presidency of the United States. If you recall, there were comments made uh, early in Barack Obama's tenure by Attorney General Eric Holder about the fact that we needed to have a discussion about race and politics in the United States. He was silent after making those comments. You have not heard him mention anything else about a discussion as it relates to a combined effort to talk about race and politics anymore. There was a segment of the population that was offended, saying, how can you discuss that? You know, we have gotten past anything that was out there that kept us apart. Uh, Drs. Browder and Sanberry have given us a of the publication of their book uh, because when you think about biracialism and politics, you have to know that in order to change something, a problem exists in the first place. And oftentimes we have a problem admitting that there is a problem even when it's right in front of us. And so as Southerners, we don't like for others to tell us about our problems. That's not their place. Um, there was a phrase that was told to me uh, when I was young, and it still bothers me to this day. It said, in the South, they love the individual but hate the race. In the North, they love the race but hate the individual. That's very disturbing to me. But if you look at what most people know about the South, all they see are the Bull Connor references. All they see are the Freedom Rider references and the like. And they don't know about the beautiful relationships that existed between individuals who knew there was a need to move us forward but could not talk about that need. Um, when you think about the genteel South and you look at politics of today, we're on the national stage again. If you look at just a few years ago in Alabama, we had more money spent on a Supreme Court race than any other state in the nation. That's unheard of for a poor state. Uh, if you think about the civil rights movement and how it opened the door and opened the eyes of the world about what was happening in the South, and it showed everyone what true Southern politics was about once the eyes were opened, um, I would say the collaboration began to ensue. Because again, just by our very nature, Southerners did not appreciate everyone in the world knowing what was happening behind its closed doors, if you will. In this day, uh, the stakes have changed. Where biracialism was once the primary focus of Southern politics, we must now focus on multiracialism. And I think that's sort of where we, we are going to have to change again in the South. We also are going to have to refocus our efforts 
on examining the extreme nature of poverty that exists in the South and the effects of politics and the political structure on education, employment, law, and civility. When Martin Luther King was alive, most of us, I, I wasn't alive at the time, sorry, but most of us were taught that his primary focus was on the movement and getting everyone to recognize the inequities in racial treatment and in racial collaboration. But what everyone forgets is that in his short lifespan, toward the end, his focus was on the poverty movement and alleviating us of that problem in the South. So when reading uh, this book and thinking about biracial politics, um, cooperative relationships, and collaboration, I came to the conclusion that if we don't, as Southerners, um, look at what we did in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, and apply those principles more openly, not secretly, more openly to what we're doing now, we are going to be making a grave mistake because we are going to have to address multiracial issues. There are other populations that are in the state and that are here to stay. We're bringing global industry to our state, so we have to recognize that and address the needs of individuals that come with those industries. We are also trying to internationalize our curriculums in high schools and at universities. And if we're going to do that, we have to recognize the contributions of other groups. We have to understand that poverty that existed in its former state is greater now than it was in its former state. And until we address that, people are going to continue to view us as the state, not just the state of Alabama, but other states as well that are behind in terms of thinking, and in terms of competitiveness with the larger, sorry, with the larger United States. So we have to consider those things. We also have to consider uh, things like the dropout rate and how our views about politics affect that. We are also going to have to have discussions, as is briefly alluded to in some segments of the book, about religion and how that influences our views about politics and who should hold political office in our state. But ultimately, it is creating a comprehensive plan for dealing with education, poverty, the legal system, and issues related to civility that will free us from sort of this mythical existence in the rest of the United States and let everyone know that we're ready to talk openly about the collaborative relationship that are discussed in self-reconstruction and about the relationships that need to exist in order for us to move forward uh, as southern states. Uh, in conclusion for these brief, brief comments, we have to talk about educating young people and giving them the full history of the South. If you look at the curriculum that exists in our schools right now, uh, Dr. Browder uh, briefly referenced it, but students learn about the civil rights movement, but everything else in between is a little bit sketchy. And so in order for us to create and continue to develop our history and let people know that Southern politics are truly unique, we have to be able to tell the rest of the story. And so I'll stop there because I know the other speakers have some insightful comments as well. Marquis Schwartz. Good afternoon. Um, I, I'm coming to this obviously from a very different perspective, also coming from that generation who grew up learning about the civil rights movement without the context of how did we get here. Um, and you know, you hear all of the heroic things that people did during the civil rights movement, but you don't hear about the quiet putting back together, the quiet reconstruction of the South to the biracial leadership that we enjoy today. Um, and I think that when you think about the times that, the, that preceded those last three decades, um, 
that was a very violent period for the South. That was war, really. And people were recovering from that. And I think you had um, some very, some people who were, who were raw. Their, their feelings were raw about that period, black and white. And the book talks about, um, at one point, it, it talks about the, the people who weren't directly on the front lines, whether they were whites who were on the front lines participating in racist behavior and blacks trying to fight for their rights. You had those people who were quietly going about their business every day, not necessarily directly impacted by some of the things that were happening. And I suspect Alabama and other parts of the South consider themselves were a part of the Bible Belt. I suspect there were some good Christians in there who felt, you know, this is too much. These, this behavior, this is my neighbor, somebody that I know. Maybe I know that they have racist attitudes, and maybe I have prejudices of my own. But that behavior, seeing somebody participating in a mob, that behavior is out of bounds. And I think, you know, the, the stealth reconstruction and particularly stealth politics formed and was birthed out of some other stealthy relationships that were going on in communities. Um, I'm someone who's just gotten an opportunity to read about what happened during those times, but I know that there are people in this room, I know that there are people in this book that are still around today who actually live these things. And I had an opportunity to read uh, Reverend Noble's book about Beyond the Burning Bus. You know, those were white and black ministers getting together behind closed doors in their churches and protecting each other to meet and talk about how can we heal our community. As a person in the media, I'm, I'm very intrigued about this idea that, you know, politicians were saying, okay, we're not going to call a press conference about this. Like, that's just not going to happen. Because I live in a world where politicians call press conferences about everything, even if it's not about anything. <laughs> so that, that's the world that I live in. So it's, it's very fascinating to me to hear that, you know, people took an active approach, but they knew that the world itself wasn't ready yet for that kind of behavior. At least our southern world wasn't ready for, for that. Um, so there, there were ministers and there were other people of goodwill, both black and white, meeting together saying, you know, we've got to put our communities back together. We've got to put things in place that are going to help us move forward and beyond this. And that didn't get out to the rest of the world. By that time, you know, other things were happening in the world that took that national attention off of the South. And I think what, what's also striking, and you have, I think people would have to realize in context that, you know, you had also some people who were ambitious who said, you know, this is my time. I'm somebody who's a moderate, who has, you know, certain progressive ideas that I want to see put forth. People like Dr. Browder who said, I want to take an active role in rebuilding my state and putting in policies, just good government policies that would benefit our state and make it go forward. And I think what's very impressive about some of the, the things that Dr. Browder did deliberately, um, just in dealing with his white constituents, he knew their attitudes. When he was confronted with somebody who was ultra racist, who was going to confront him about his attitude about race, he just simply didn't talk about race. He talked about jobs. He talked about, you know, good government, things, things that people could identify with that got them totally, completely away from the idea of race to where the point it didn't matter. And the things that he was talking about weren't things that were good for just white people. They were good for everybody. If he's talking about jobs, then that's good for everybody. And I think some politicians can learn a lot about how to neutralize some of the things that seem to be divisive to talk about the things that are good for everyone. Um, as a journalist, I think there is some opportunity for some research. While those weren't front page things and while the media wasn't called particularly to participate, I think that there might be some good uh, research to be done in journalism history um, regarding what was recorded. It seems very odd to me that in a time preceding that where you have some very progressive national as well as southern editors and publishers, there were way more newspapers and media uh, in the state of Alabama than we currently see today. Um, we had evening and morning papers, competitive papers who were trying to get the story Clearly, the story of reconciliation isn't as exciting as conflict because what we cover is mostly about conflict. But I suspect that everything wasn't hidden or could be kept hidden. White people showing up at black churches, that, that's going to cause a stir, even if, even if nobody's directly running to the paper to tell anybody about it. You know, if I was at my church and somebody white showed up that I hadn't seen before, 
that that might perk me up a little bit, and I might not run tell the paper, but I might tell somebody who knows somebody else who knows somebody at the paper, or somebody who might have been in the audience might have wrote just a little note. I would encourage somebody to look at what was recorded in white papers, what editorials were doing at that time, but also um, a lot that we don't talk about is the black press's involvement. Um, there's a, a book called The Race Beat that does mention some of the things of how the black press was the leading edge of the civil rights movement who gave the warning salvo about this was going down, this was about to happen, and the mainstream media and most white people ignored it. You know, they don't read, most people don't read the black press, and they didn't at that time. And I suspect there were maybe little snippets in, in various places. They might not have been on the front page, but I suspect if, if, if Dr. Browder had voted for a particular piece of legislation, there might have been a notation somewhere that he did that, um, which, you know, at least told people if he did, wasn't able to tell them directly that he's on, you know, the side of these folks who are trying to get these things done, that he's doing what he said he would do, that he's keeping his promise. Um, I think there's also that tension. I, I saw in the book that there was question about, you know, whether there was, whether to Dr. Reed about whether there was, Uncle Tomism and whether you were conceding too much. But I suspect if everyone took, and most people know Representative Alvin Holmes, I suspect if everybody took the Alvin Holmes approach, um, Alvin Holmes is a very vocal, still very much active member of the Alabama State Legislature. If everyone took that approach, a lot of the things that did get done wouldn't have gotten done. And these people recognized and knew that, both black and white. And I don't think it takes away from the black leaders um, what they were doing because they got a lot done in a very quiet manner. I mean, when we talk about how we got the two African-American federal judges, you know, they got that done. It did not happen. It got done. And I think, I think that's important to, to recognize. It doesn't by acknowledging what the white leaders were doing, what white politicians were doing by reaching out to African-American voters. I don't think it detracts at all from what was done prior to that or what was done in the ensuing years because a lot got done. I mean, when you look at the representation, um, the balance of representation in the Alabama legislature, I mean, there are other places in the country that have that kind of representation and still have it and maintain it to this day. And I think also the other fascinating thing about this book is that, you know, most of these people are still alive. For people my age and younger, those are history book people. They don't exist for them, for real. But the fact that you can talk to somebody who's been in the legislature since 1975, you can talk to a guy who was in the Love Fest uh, election between Browder and uh, former mayor of Tuskegee, Johnny Ford, those people still exist. That's walking around living history. And the more that we can talk about that through things like this, through looking and doing more research into the other contextual things that were happening at that time, I think that that's immeasurable for the future generation. I'll leave my time. Yeah. Dr. Stewart. In our interview with Joe Reed, we were talking to him about his relationship with George Wallace. And this is the person who asked Joe Reed if he were an Uncle Tom. <laughs> uh, and I won't tell you what Joe Reed said, but you, you'd find uh, that interesting. <laughs> it, it's in the book. Dr. Stewart. I found this book, Self Politics by Dr. Browder and Dr. Stanberry to be obviously a very interesting book and also one that does indeed fill a gap as far as our literature on Southern politics is concerned. I would like to make a few comments today relating the 2010 gubernatorial election here in Alabama, which of course is still in progress, but I would like to make some comments pertaining to the election and see to what extent we have made movements away from stealth politics. As Dr. Browder and Dr. Stanberry emphasize here in this book, uh, stealth politics is to be regarded primarily as a uh, transitional phenomenon. As the authors point out, the politicians who they concentrate on were primarily doing things in a secretive way because they feared that they would alienate some of their vital constituencies if they uh, behaved in a more open way. Blacks were already voting in substantial numbers at the conclusion of the conclusive de decade for this 
study, namely the 1990s, at present here in Alabama, it's estimated that we have 2.5 million active voters, and of these, approximately 650,000 are African American voters. A sharp rise in African American voters was noted in the 2008 presidential election. However, African American voters have not been motivated in 2010 to the extent that they were in 2008. Now, a year ago at this time, uh, if we'd had a panel dealing with what we were, would talk about the upcoming 2010 election, I'm sure most of us would have probably predicted that Representative Arthur Davis would emerge as the uh, Democratic nominee. As we all know, that obviously did not happen, and there was a very decisive defeat for Representative Davis. It was estimated that blacks would constitute 50 or more percent of the Democratic primary participants. And since we would expect that African-American voters would support the first serious African-American candidate for the state's highest office in our history, then again, Representative Davis would be the long-term favorite as far as the primary was concerned. The polls showed that Davis was favored over Sparks by a large margin, and some of our establishment politicians were so convinced that Arthur Davis would indeed weep, uh, emerge victorious from the primary that they opted out. People like Lieutenant Governor Folsom, uh, he opted out. When, if he had been in, possibly he would have won. Obviously, you can conjecture about all sorts of things. Chief Justice Sue L. Cobb of the Supreme Court was approached, and there was an effort tried to get uh, there was an effort to get her to run, and of course she declined, uh, showing that the establishment African American groups did not like Davis. They approached people like uh, Judge Charles Price here in uh, Montgomery to try to get him to run, but uh, he ultimately declined. But as you've already heard, uh, the relationship between Davis and the established black organizations has been tumultuous from the start of Davis's career. He beat Earl Hilliard, despite that incumbent strong support from the black Democratic establishment. But Davis was quoted as saying that he didn't think he had to pander to the traditional black establishment. But ultimately, it would cost him dearly for neglecting that important element of the Alabama electorate. Even though Davis's public snub of the black groups went against what candidates were supposed to do, he did have a history of swimming upstream and doing it successfully. And I would see from time to time letters to the editor to the effect that black political organizations are no longer needed to help blacks decide whom to vote for. No one would have thought it possible, possibly even as late as last year, that black political organizations would endorse a white person over, again, the first serious black candidate for governor in, Al in, uh, in Alabama's history. But Davis's strategy was said to involve, it, involve winning white voters before gaining the support of a black leader. He was taking for granted that he would have the African-American masses of voters, but he wanted to win over whites without, uh, of course, losing the blacks. That's why this is an interesting phenomenon, because it seems like it's the result of the or reverse of the stealth politics that Browder and Sanberry uh, talk about in their, uh, what I regard as an excellent book. In, those, in that book, the white politicians were fearful of losing white support, so they uh, tried to get black support covertly. Davis possibly should have had more fear of losing black support. He possibly should not have taken that black support so much for granted because he ended up losing that. Uh, and the whites who participated in the Democratic primary were not uh, turned on by the strategy that Davis used. In fact, uh, 
polls showed that 80% of those who uh, voted in the Democratic primary, black and white, favored the health care legislation, for example. The electorate in the Democratic primaries today is certainly more liberal than it was in the days when Representative Browder was running, and the whites, for the most part, have moved over to the Republican Party. There was, for the first time in 2010, there were more uh, participants in the Republican primary than there were in the Democratic primary, despite all of the uh, local races that were on the ballot, and many of those continued to be held by Democrats. We've talked about the role of the black churches. Davis visited the black churches on the Sunday before the primary, and according to one report in the Birmingham News that said the crowd exploded in applause when Davis pointed out that a race for governor like his wouldn't have even been possible three decades ago. But they exploded in applause, but two days later they didn't uh, show that in their votes. They did not uh, back up their applause with their votes. Ron Sparks got the votes big time as far as both blacks and whites were concerned. Jesse Jackson said you can't vote against health care and call yourself a black man. Many black voters believe that Davis had sold his soul in order to try to ultimately gain the governorship. Davis, it was claimed, was seeking to become Alabama's first black governor despite the black vote. And this indeed did produce a surprising black backlash in the black community. Black politicians, as the 2010 results showed, can no longer take for granted that they will receive the African-American vote. Davis lost the older generation of black leaders without gaining any enthusiastic support from young African Americans. Those who were on the front lines of the civil rights movement, as our professors Browder and Stanberry point out, were determined to maintain their influence, and they were able to do that in 2010. Davis spurned the black political groups to make himself more appealing to white voters, but his strategy boomeranged big, big time. Davis's loss in the black precincts was described as stunning. Dr. Reed, who you've heard mentioned for several times in our discussion thus far, he said he rejected black voters to go for white. He acted more like a Republican than a Democrat. Reed also is quoted as having said he had to learn there are things you just don't do. And Representative Holmes, who was just cited here, he said black voters deserted him in droves after he deserted them. It's called political payback. Even a rookie politician should know that. Obviously, Ron Sparks, who would emerge victorious on primary day, he did not behave in a stealthy manner at all because, as has been pointed out, he openly sought the endorsement of the black political groups, the ADC and the NSC, and he was proud to go before them. He said he would go before any group that he could possibly approach and win support. Sparks ended up winning all but two predominantly black counties, Montgomery and Sumter. The old guard blacks viewed Davis as an upstart who could not win the general election and who may jeopardize down-ballot party candidates or who might have jeopardized down-party candidates or down-ballot party candidates had he actually won the nomination. Davis should have gone around them, the kingmakers, to court black rank and file voters at least to do that, but he didn't do nearly enough. He didn't have a ground game. So he lost the core of the white vote, and he lost the black vote also. There are many whites who still won't vote for a black, no matter how conservative he may be, so the uh, strategy that Davis was pursuing uh, was probably unrealistic to begin with. Uh, the book here talks about uh, white politicians uh, appointing blacks but not making a big deal of it. Sparks rightly did make a big deal of the fact that he had appointed blacks to 27 of 66 registrar seats across Alabama. He appointed blacks to two of the top four positions in the department he headed, the Department of Agriculture and Industry. And he's continued to... Uh, praise his own record as he should 
uh, because it's an excellent record as far as promoting black aspirations is concerned. But here we stand now on the brink of the November election, and we find uh, Mr. Sparks trailing by double digits as far as the polls are concerned. We know that the polls were not uh, accurate as far as the Democratic primary vote was concerned, but uh, I tend to believe that this time that the polls are accurate and uh, that Dr. Robert Bentley will be our next governor. We uh, voted four Republicans for governor in five of the last six elections, and we're, we've become increasingly a red state. So I don't, and uh, Sparks has not uh, moved to the center. He had a perfect strategy, as everybody points out, as far as winning the Democratic primary is concerned, but he has not moved to the center in order to try to uh, say things that would attract more white voters who didn't vote for him in the Democratic primary, and then now he's had the unfortunate blow-up of the gambling indictments. He's not implicated at all in any wrongdoing, but the issue that is the centerpiece of this campaign has become the subject of a lot of arguments related to alleged corruption in the legislature. So uh, everything is wrong, wrong has gone, uh, has gone, everything has gone wrong as far as he is concerned. Uh, this past Sunday evening, I heard uh, Commissioner Sparks speak at the opening of Cuba Week at the University of Alabama, and I, I was telling a student about that uh, Monday, and the person said, do you think he would have spoken at Cuba Week if he were in the lead for governor now? And I said, no, I don't think so. <laughs> I, I, so that, that may have been a telltale sign that he was indeed behind, that he was speaking and talking about his initiatives to Cuba, which I, actually I find very worthwhile because he has open new markets for agricultural products, and we've been talking about economic development, and that is an aspect of economic development. But with that, I'll close, Tim, and however you want to approach it around, and however Dr. Browder and Dr. Stanberry want to approach it, would be fine. Okay. I think uh, we have an opportunity for folks, uh, anyone in the audience who would like to ask a question with a microphone over here. If you just raise your hand, we'll get a, a mic to you. You can ask it directly of anyone individually or more broadly, and we'll let whoever wants to pick up the ball do so. Here. What, what time frame is covered in your book? Um, from 75 to 85? Or 1970s, 80s, and 90s. The, the, that's between two eras. The civil rights era when blacks were not participants in, in, uh, in everyday politics. And by the mid-1990s, things had changed so much. We had undergone the, the, you know, the uh, realignment to where the Republicans, we had two-party politics with Republicans uh, in very strong position. And stealth, po stealth politics was no, long, it no longer uh, was possible. It no longer uh, worked. Sure. Uh, it, it seems that uh, most of the discussion, uh, it is a political discussion, I, we're sort of setting aside the little community relations that have formed. But in a political context, almost all of this is in the context of democratic politics. And nobody has really addressed politics within the Republican Party, which uh, particularly Dr. Stewart just alluded to, is uh, rather strong now in Alabama. So how does that play out? What's been the biracial politics, if any, in the Republican Party? What does it say about their legit legitimacy for governing? Or is this address, I, obviously, we've had a movement, a wholesale movement of uh, white voters to the Republican Party. And uh, since Alabama has a population that's approximately 75% white and only 25% African American, I think the Republicans, even though they might say we want to attract more blacks to the Republican Party, and if you go to Republican events, you see a few African Americans in attendance, but I think basically they feel like that they can win without having any substantial African American support, as long as they can do that, that's how they will do. They won't, they won't make major efforts to uh, recruit blacks, and they won't uh, shape platforms that would uh, try to 
in, uh, decrease poverty, as we've had discussed here, that we need to focus more on uh, reducing still the unacceptable poverty rate in Alabama. I, I don't think the Republicans, I think if Dr. Bentley is elected, as it looks like he will, we'll probably have the most conservative governor we've had in Alabama in a long time because I, I think he's more conservative and more ideologically on the right than Governor Riley is. And, of course, as we know Governor Riley, when he had his first full year in office in 2003, he did try to bring some fairness to the Alabama tax system, but it failed miserably. And so after that, he didn't touch it again. But I, I think uh, I'm... I'm I know the AEA endorsed uh, Robert Bentley because they had such a big antipathy toward, toward uh, Bradley Byrne, but I, I think uh, once Bentley gets in office, they, the AEA may not be so glad that they supported him because I think he's going to turn out to be very conservative. He's already talking about uh, changing employment uh, regulations and retirement ages and stuff like that. And, He's saying, well, I'm not going to need gambling in order to get more revenue, but we're going to change employment conditions. So, again, I think he, he's going to be elected and he's going to be more conservative. And I'm, I'm not taking, obviously, I'm not taking a stand one way or the other on the election, but I just think we're not going to see the types of changes that uh, have been discussed here today uh, following the January inauguration of Dr. Bentley. 